Please, uh, may I have your attention for uh, Jan Nijsmans? He is going to tell us about uh, fossil source control management and SQLite uh, 3. Uh, thank you, welcome here all. Uh, first I will tell a little bit about myself, how I come here, uh, what I'm doing here. Uh, well, I'm invited by uh, Bas. Uh, I guess it was too rich a trip uh, to tell about something, uh, about an open source project that I think is quite successfully gaining acceptance in, in the world. I work at uh, ICT uh, automatisering. We have offices in uh, Netherlands, in uh, Belgium. Oh, do I have a colleague here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I um, uh, work for big companies, mainly in the industry, like uh, Philips, uh, ASML, Siemens, or car factories, all kinds of more like uh, technical software. Uh, I personally use Fossil uh, in that small communication things in-house. Uh, not that much, it's not widespread in my company, but I, I would like to uh, spread it more, you know, simply because I like it. Um, what I'll talk about is uh, upscaling Fossil. Fossil started as a small project. I will tell about the history uh, a little bit more. And uh, but now well, I'm, I'm seeing that more and more people are starting to use it and then it's showing its weaknesses well, those weaknesses how they are addressed how is functioning now uh, I will tell something about it first I don't see anything here <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, see the first page here I don't see it changing there. I guess I have to do it this way then. <laughs> it's not so functioning like. Uh, oh, is that a busy cursor over the presentation? There is a window that says recovered down there. Perhaps uh, the presentation is hanging. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. See a busy cursor. Ah, okay. Yes, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I start telling a little bit about software configuration management version control uh, in general. I assume you all are using uh, version control, uh, subversion, uh, git, <laughs> what kind of things are used here? Who uses git? Oh, we're going to have to be careful with what you say. Something else? Something else? Material. Materials. Okay, so no one uses uh, CVS uh, no. so so version anymore. Well, so you know <laughs> already a little bit <laughs> basics about uh, uh, configuration management. I tell a, a little bit about it, how it started with the history CVS version, Git, Mercurial, how they got a place in this story. So why fossil also belongs in the same list? A little bit about SQLite. What last week uh, 3.8 is released. What new things in it? 
what makes it faster, more suitable uh, for upscaling. Just to your fossil, also uh, two weeks ago, no, uh, yesterday, 1.27 came out a few days ago. Uh, I will tell something about what happened in the past for SourceForge, the yeah, SourceForge outage that it happened uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, that was in fact the main reason that's when my story from Fossil started. Uh, before that, I heard the name, but I never used it. It never occurred to me to start using it. But uh, in January 2011, my story with Fossil starts. Uh, big data, well, what happens when it's growing huge? Well, what we basically do if we want to manage software, suppose we have some directory workspace named workspace, and there are a lot of directories <coughs> under it. And suppose you don't have a version control system, then what would you do? You're changing the software. You want to remember what, I, what you did. Well, of course, you can create all kinds of directories, workspace with some number. And if you want to do a commit to, to save the space, what I have now, you do simply you make another directory, and all the files in my current web workspace, you copy it over to the workspace copy, and you remember the total state. And uh, this way you can work without the version of the control system, and still remember what you're doing if you want to know what did I do in some specific commit, you just do a diff between those two uh, directories and you see what's changed. Well, then you don't have some meta information, for example, what did you do the change for, but you can put a readme in each of those directories to see, okay, I did this commit because of that, or you, you can do version control <coughs> this way only to become huge. You need a lot of disk space and many files are copy of one another, many files in different directories. They only differ a very little bit from each other. You edited one little line in one file, well then you have two directories, the two complete files, but only a little difference. Well, the Version control systems, like a, a subversion does it as well, JIT does it as well, they all have something inside to, to make it more economical. So if you store a file, uh, then don't store it completely. If there is some other file similar, then only store the difference between it in some place and the pointer to the difference where it was made from. And you can reconstruct the file, you don't have to store it uh, completely. But then the storage, the way you store it, becomes more complicated and complicated. You don't have everything packed out, but it stores it in some way. So this manual approach, well, uh, there's more things. If you build the software, you have source code and you build that, you want a C compiler in it, it, it produces an executable, but you don't want to store all those built things. It will become more huge and uh, you don't know what state is in this. It's completely built, you want to throw it away. So which files in that tree do you want to remember the history? Certainly not all of them. Uh, well, it takes a big storage, you don't have a meta information of what happened in that, thing, in that, that directory that you created. Uh, there is no sharing between people, of course you can put those director structure in the shared drive and then everyone can see what you were doing. But again, if then multiple people are start working <coughs> on the same software, how do you resolve the conflicts? Uh, with it. That kind of things are the basic things, the basic problems that version control is trying to solve to you. Well, CVS is started by uh, Dick Groon. You can find uh, this kind of sentence uh, 
so he was, it is based on earlier system, but he just created a small system that for his students that they can. Uh, it was from the free university, or not? Yeah. Yes, it was a text. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it didn't. This message you can find uh, there. So uh, apparently he is on the base of uh, CVS. Well, you see the Amsterdam compiler, KC compiler. That was a project where it was used for. I, I heard that he uh, put the code somewhere, mm -hmm. and after some years he started getting. Uh, the, he never thought of it again, and he started mm -hmm. getting uh, questions of people. Yes. And he started to see uh, showing up his code. Yeah, it became uh, very popular. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but in the beginning he didn't know uh, of it. He didn't. No. So, but it was one of the first systems that were easy working with. Well, it had a, it had its problem. <coughs> we know now, now it's growing better, but Forge Forge used it for a long time, mm -hmm. and. It simply works, and it's a simple model. It has this problem, no atomic commits. So if some commits goes halfway, it might be that some files are committed, some are not. So uh, subversion is in fact designed to resolve that. It's, uh, it's uh, CVS done better. That's also the goal of subversion. Subversion is also very popular, uh, but it's not distributed. So now we are getting into the story, okay, now we are getting distributed. All the things that come in mind then is Git and Mercurial. I think that are the top two most popular <laughs> distributed systems. They both are rewritten or thrown away, I don't know how you call it, from BitKeeper. BitKeeper was a commercial system that also was very popular in the open source world. Uh, it was used, used for by the Linux uh, developer, Linus Torvalds was, uh, 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 he liked it very much because of the way it worked. But it was commercial, but BitKeeper had only one license uh, um, that, that, that was good. It, an open source project could use it for free if they fulfilled some conditions. And one of those conditions was that it was forbidden to reverse engineer anything that was related to version control. So that was a kind of a big problem. <coughs> And that was also why two different people, in the Storhoff and Mark Mackel, independently from each other, started, well, uh, we don't want it. And the day they started to build a version control system, at that moment they violated the BitKeeper license, so we couldn't use it anymore. Actually, if I may yes. add to that, I think the problem was that Andrew Chichel, who I think is the original R-Sync developer, or maybe one of the Samba guys, he started reverse engineering the BitKeeper protocol and then BitKeeper had to retract the license for the mm -hmm. Linux project. And so Linux worked, I think, without version control at all for a few weeks or a few months. And Linus and Matt started at the same time, roughly, to build their version control systems, but that was after BitKeeper license was retracted because Trigil uh, started reverse engineering the protocol. Yes, I don't know exactly these days. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, Git and well, Linux, they started to make a system that is very <coughs> versatile, that can do everything. Well, I'm here with mathematicals, <laughs> so this is a statement you can find on the web. Uh, it's simple to think of the state of our Git repository. As a point in a high dimensional code space, I will not read it, uh, read it further, but uh, anyone who understands this sentence? Well, I don't, <laughs> but there seems to be a mathematical theory behind it in which you can declare uh, the, the knowledge. In Git, you can make a lot of bran branches. It will start getting complicated. You will need a, not a lot of knowledge to understand the model before you can uh, really uh, work work with it. Um, 
if you understand that, then you can work with it well. But it's, it takes some time to get uh, acquainted with uh, that. Uh, so another thing that's a, a problem if you use distributed version control but don't synchronize that much so this is a mail from Lin Linux 12 of uh, one week ago then his hard disk crashed for the whole day he didn't uh, sync so all his work from that day was uh, lost this is his message Well, so, <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's wise to keep this slide in, but uh, anyway. This is a thing that's uh, a problem with uh, HIT, that it has a complicated model. You have to be careful what you push and what you pull, and if you don't do that, you, you can uh, lose work. It's, for the average person, a little bit too difficult to, uh, to use it. So then what, what, should, what should you do to have... Uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, uh, Richard Hip, he's the author of SQLite, uh, he wanted a version control system for SQLite. That's the basic, that's where Fossil uh, comes from. So let's talk a little bit about SQLite. Uh, SQL byte well, is SQL database. How many of you know SQL or do something with SQL or something? Oh, that's more than I, uh, than I uh, expected. Because SQL is normally for different things. You don't use it to use for small data. For example, if you write a simple um, program like business message and if you have to create a cache which stores the message, then every message is just a text String, we might may, might store a date, but uh, I don't I don't know what what the cache is implemented with. Does it use SQLite or does it use uh, maybe some files in a directory or in Java some property files or some XML files or I don't know. But normally for programs, programmers do that: a simple text file, XML property files to store simple things in. Well, um, what Richard Hip wanted was, uh, the, well the or original idea was uh, a database for Tickle TK. How many know Tickle TK? Uh, a, a few person. Okay, it, it was a scripting language that's uh, <coughs> still used by surprisingly many people, but it's hidden under the surface of uh, using it at the back end in, in a lot of places, but not many people really know that it's there, but it, it's doing its, uh, its job. And Richard Hip was one of the uh, members of the uh, Tickle Core team. Uh, I'm also a member of the Tickle uh, Core team. Uh, for, for it's not a presentation about tickle to case, so I will not go deeper in that. But it's uh, uh, that was the basic idea to build a little database, a small database, therefore a SQLite engine for uh, tickle to case. Well, the history days. Um, I don't know much about the details. In that early history, what I know is that last of, in the 26th of August 3.8 came out, and that has the next generation query plan. That's the main fe feature of that. If you have a database, you want to search information in it, then SQL allows you to describe the information you want to search for. It doesn't, SQL doesn't need to describe you in what order you search, do you start in the beginning or at the end, or if you start to search in two different columns, you want to search something, which of the columns you start first in. 
So it's in first. <coughs> so normally in SQL, SQL database as a query planner, it looks at the query and sees, okay, this is the query, this is the information I get. How should I get it? And what, what earlier SQL uh, versions did was uh, <coughs> look at the elements of the, of the query one at a time. So to see, okay, I want something from this column and from this column. Which one should I look first? And then it has some uh, measurements, or it can analyze the, the data. But then it makes a decision, okay, I should use that one first. Then there are more columns to search for, which of them I will search first then. So it makes one decision, then takes it, and goes on. The next generation uh, query planner can have multiple decisions in parallel and choose the best of that. There are more SQL databases that already do that, but SQL Lite wants to be simple, never implemented that, now it implemented it. And the, the result of that should be is that, it, uh, that it's faster in common situations. It does a better, it creates, it can execute the query better, so the database can be large and still it can be searched in reasonable time. How does it compare different plans? How does it choose which is the best one? Uh, I don't know the details about that, but um, it has some kind of cost measure for everything. It looks at the size of, of some column. Uh, so for each decision, it calculates the cost on that using some, some heuristics. Oh, so it simply didn't do that before? It did that, but it looked at one column, and, and column one, two, and three, and the cost for one is this, the cost for two is that, and then and it cho already choose the best one. Okay. Now it takes the best five, and it keeps that, and then updating the cost for every new information, and only in the final stage, choose the best one. They place chess and uh, more yes. steps ahead. Yes. yes. So you can compare it with chess. And one step you cannot see yet really what the, what the situation is. And about version 4, I don't have any idea what the feature of that would be. I know there is a fossil repository that contains a version 4 of SQL. It has a new low level uh, storage engine which is supposed to be more efficient than level DB. I have no, I have no idea. In fact, I only started uh, looking at SQLite because I was looking at uh, Fossil. Okay, the history of Fossil. Um, in fact, there is a kind of dual marriage between Fossil and SQLite. You cannot see one independent of the, of the other. Fossil started because Richard Hip wanted to have a better version <coughs> control. He used CVS before that, but he wanted a be better version control than that. And he was not satisfied with Hit and thought it was too uh, complicated. And well, if you have a database and you have a lot of information about commits and uh, comments in it and metadata information about files and that, well, I'm not stored in the database, I have a database. <coughs> that makes it a completely different structure. You don't have a directory with files anymore. You can do many more things in it. You can <coughs> split it in different tables. One table that remembers which file names were used. Another table which tags are put in some commits. Another table that has the links, one commit. <coughs> Which other commits did it come from? Uh, about uh, 20, 30 tables, I don't know. You can make a very efficient storage in which you can search very fast. And that's what he, in fact, what he wanted. And all kinds of tricks that other version controls uses. If you store a file and don't store it as is, maybe only for the first commit, but you can compress it with Zlib and uh, oh, if there was is already another file from a previous commit that's very similar, you can make a diff on it and store that one instead. 
all kinds of tricks like that are used in Fossil to make it smaller. They use the features of SQLite to store it in the most efficient way you can think uh, of it. And also keep things, if you store it in a database with tables, then you can uh, create indexes on it so that you can search very fast uh, uh, on it. Um, in 2010, the end of 2010, then there was a, 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 a German boy, George Sonnenberger, who gave a presentation two years ago. He said, well, that's nice, we can uh, start using uh, uh, Fossil. And he used it on NetBSD to, to store that one. And uh, he noticed well, it's becoming slow. Uh, if I do a commit, it takes about 10 minutes uh, before it's doing something useful. It's not, not useful at all. The first release was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so well, the the first release was a long time ago, 1003 years. <laughs> That's why it's called <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, a small book book in, uh, it's a small book in the presentation. You have to be ah, 10,000. 10, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> thank you. Yes, that's the first release. Well, I just looked in the history of Fossil itself. Well, it's in a database, so I can search very fast what happened there and which which things were tagged with the tag release. And the first one was 2010, so it appears that's the first release that he showed up. I cannot see it's what version number it is or anything. Uh, first the first release that really had a version number was 1.18, and it was also in the half of 1.18. Uh, it <coughs> was in June uh, 2011. But what uh, Jörg Sonnenberg discovered was his repository <coughs> really had thousands or ten thousands of small files, while up to then, normally the repositories that hosted uh, Fossil, they had a few hundred files in the directory that were bigger. They were not used to have that many, that small files in a single repository. And every commit just has a text file with all the files in it. So that means that every commit already even did it, even, even containing small changes, already needs one big text file. What files are in it? And most of the files didn't change at all. So that's why in the end of 2010 or beginning of 2011, there was a Delta manifest. Uh, added by Richard Hip to Fossil and that made uh, it more useful for even that kind of big repositories like NetBSD. So that's what I think the end of 2010, the beginning of 2011, I think that Fossil got into a state in which you can say, okay, it's usable, you don't need it, you can use it for bigger things than only small things. <coughs> when I downloaded my first version of Fossil, it was 1.22. And the same happened with me also. Uh, I downloaded it and I wanted to use it in a project for, uh, for synchronizing two things. I was building software and it needed to run, I wanted it to run on Unix. Solaris in this case and on Windows because I had some tools on Windows that I wanted to use uh, it. and I wanted to simply synchronize with it and in the environment there was a shared disk somewhere that was mounted from use Unix and from Windows so I thought hey I can use Fossil for that I can uh, simply store the repository on that shared disk and from the Windows machine and from the Solaris machine I can check out so I did that, and I had a, a working environment. <laughs> 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 
So that's what I thought. Okay, let's uh, commit my first repository. And what I did was I got a panic and I, I couldn't get the commit uh, uh, to work. What was the reason? The environment that I had had some links in it. It was a Unix environment, so it's Solaris environment. <coughs> it had links in it, and the links didn't point to anything. There were, there were unresolved links in it. And Fossil was trying to commit it and says, okay, what files do I have in that directory? Found one and tries to open it. Ah. I can't open it. Logically, the file doesn't exist. It's only a link pointing to nothing. And that was a panic. The commit was rolled back. And uh, <coughs> nothing I could do. So that's when I started to look into the Fossil code. Okay, where was that panic? Let's see if I can change it to a warning if it uh, goes on there. Well, I found a place, I changed it into a warning, and it worked. So that was my first experience with the code of Fossil. So I looked in the website, okay, let's report this. I reported it to uh, Fossil, to Richard Hip. And one month later, it was adapted, it was uh, in the official code. I started with this more. Uh, discovering more problems, I reported them all. And finally, Richard got uh, uh, tired of me, I think, because he gave me commit rights that I could do the things uh, separately in a branch. And, uh, that's, I think, the way gaining uh, access to an open source project, just starting to submit patches and things, getting more acquainted with this until the people trust you and see, hey, he, uh, he can write some, some good code, so let, let's accept that. Uh, one thing I later did is better Unicode UTF-8. The main developers normally work on Unix, but on Windows, so I happen to use Windows together with this problem sometimes, you saw that. Um, but the Windows API, Windows normally uses Unicode API to so that you don't have to worry about Windows code page and correct set, just use UTF-8 or Unicode everywhere. That's I built, a thing I built in Fossil, that now on Windows you don't have to worry anymore <coughs> if there are trained characters inside your commit message or anything. That was also a problem in fast, past versions of uh, Fossil. Version 1.27. Well, it came out last week. One thing I did in that is uh, sequence 64 uh, support. There were still some errors with large, large pointers in it. Well, this is the first. Uh, so this version you can download it on six, sequence 64. Six, sequence 64. Configure, make, and it works. So early versions don't try that. It will, uh, it will get problems. Is that one of the things you uh, contribute? Yes. Because uh, you use Sigmund a lot. Yes, I mean, Sigmund 6. Not also allows, no, but I use it because I want a Unix environment on my Windows machine. As well as Sigmund <coughs> is one of the easiest. I think Sigmund 64 came out a half a year ago. And in the beginning, it has problems. You cannot. Uh, there is an SQLite 3.7 for it, but it was already hacked from the original version to make it a little bit uh, workable. Well, with 3.8.1, it's not released yet, but the fossil version already create, contains a beta of 3.8.1. But the problem is, as far as I know, and I'm using it, for me it works without problems. Sure, people will find new things. Uh, in it, but the ones I found, they are solved. Yeah. Well, a little bit into the future, one problem in uh, Fossil is that it doesn't have good integration with other things. It's one executable, Fossil.exe or simply Fossil, depends on the platform. And you can run it and 
that's it. So it's very easy to install, just download it, uh, put it in your path somewhere, and you can run it. But now there are two things going on. One time, one thing started by Stefan uh, Biel, the German, if he lives in, uh, in Germany, in Munster. He started lit for sale, so to take out things, uh, design a C API in which you can call this so, so you can integrate the fossil functionality into your own program so you can create a GUI for it, for it or anything you like. Another one is FOSS Clips. I started uh, that to make an uh, integration for Eclipse. Well, that's, that's what people want as long as there is no Eclipse integration and I don't think uh, people all the it will become really popular. That's a must-have, I think. So I started uh, to design on, on that a little bit. There is already, yes? Is there a time plan for lip fashion? Uh, no, there isn't. <laughs> In what state is it? Uh, uh, very early. So only three, four months ago uh, that it started. Uh, I cannot run it even on Sigma 64. I tried it. But it uh, but does still it, has. The, does it go into the releases now, or no. is it really no, very it's completely separate? It's a branch. It's completely separate. The only thing is that the license is exactly the same as Fossil, yeah. so, so we can use a lot a new, of. It's a new implementation. It's a new implementation, but there is already an implementation of many functionality in Fossil, and that's just copied out and uh, made safer. Okay. That kind of thing, but it's a totally separate uh, project. I think quite interesting. Mm. <coughs> yes. Okay, how I started to get uh, familiar with uh, fossil. It was the third attack that happened on uh, January 26. I don't know if anyone of you remember that. Yes, you remember that? Our uh, syllable operating system project is on it. <laughs> it's, it's not the only one I remember. Yes, well, Tinkle TK was one of the projects that was also um, uh, damaged. No, it was not damaged. Everything was restored. But for a uh, long time, we, could, we couldn't work because of this attack. SourceForge shut down all CVS uh, uh, accounts, and no one could work anymore for a few days, three, four days. How much it was? Yeah, something. Something like that. Maybe a week, not, not more than that, until everything was restored. Yeah, the big problem was that you couldn't be sure that your data was restored. Mm -hmm. It was restored, but we don't know for sure. Uh, yes, but uh, that was the reason that the Tickle TK community started to think, well, it's not good that we depend on that. And, uh, well, so we should do something else. Well, because Richard Hibbel is a big, was one of the initial, one of the initial members of the Tickle core team, of course he was consulted as well, and he said, well, okay, start using Fossil. So he donated some server, and uh, when this happens, then some people got together and think, okay, this is the time to have something new. It's the good to test fossil in some big environment. Uh, let's switch over to fossil. So a number of people did that. They started writing scripts to do all the conversion from uh, source from, from CVS. The way it was was, but of course every project they find the difficulties that it doesn't work for their structure, so it was a lot of hard work. But it worked, and all the CVS data from source force was converted to a fossil uh, repository and uh, put online, and that's when I started to use it. <coughs> now let's look at uh, some repositories that are online now using Fossil. Well, of course, Fossil itself, at this moment, there are totally of 500, 
5,911 the commits done until I say this state. It's not completely honest because when Richard Hip started designing the fossil, he started on CVS, but when uh, it became, became milestone <coughs> one, it became usable, then he just put the current direct current working space in fossil itself, he committed it and started working from there. So all the history before that in CVS is gone, he didn't need it, it was not a state, I think, that he wanted other people to see. So those commits, at the first commit, fossil was already used, <coughs> could do some commits and uh, some, some things uh, in it. So that's uh, six, a little bit more than six uh, years ago that milestone one of fossil uh, happened. Well, when it got, got a little bit more stable, then we started the SQL light uh, to convert that from CBS to a fossil repository. That's why SQL light, uh, the repository starts when fossil didn't even exist. It's just because it was converted from CVS. And there are about uh, almost 12,000 commits uh, uh, with it. And now the size is about 60 megabytes. So you can imagine that the whole history of 13 years, all the files that were ever committed, all the meta <coughs> information, all the comments that, that he put in when he committed it. 6.60 megabytes. Well, that's, that's nothing how many of those repositories you can uh, hold on your memory stick. Uh, you can take it in your pocket and uh, 60 megabytes. The fossil well, under 14 megabytes. So when Tickle and TK started converting to fossil, it's, well, we should knew that well, it's bigger than what I'm doing because they already exist uh, for 14 years, or well, they exist longer, but 14 years ago, then that work was put into CVS. And uh, in uh, January 2011, when the source of outage was, then those two repositories were, co were converted from CVS to uh, Fossil. And the result is that uh, Tickle is 188 megabytes. Also, not big, I would say. And it contains the total history of 15 years. The total project information as hosted in Fossil and as hosted in source so, uh, Number of tickets in Tickle Graphs. At this moment, 6,751 tickets. So Fossil is also an issue tracker. It's a wiki, it has a lot more information than only a version of the control. Everything is stored in the database and, and connected with it. So, function of CVS track, or I don't know if it, uh, it has something like that. Beyond the in the tool. Yeah. They say, uh, they say it's GitHub in a box, don't they? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it looks like it. I mean, uh, the two repositories from George Schoenberger, they are below. And you can see they are quite a bit bigger, well, about uh, more than 1 million commits in NetBSD source, more than 2 million commits in NetBSD. The number of files is also quite big, so that's really huge. And still, the results of repositories, 2 megabytes a little bit more than 9 gigabytes. It's still manageable. It's getting huge, but I think that uh, it shows that well, SQL Lite, I wouldn't call it light anymore. It's still called light, but if SQL Lite can manage such huge database, it's still workable with it, then I think that's quite good. I think we're almost at the final, yes, it was a final sheet uh, already. Any questions? Uh, yes, um, I'm actually wondering what's the big advantage? Why should we use uh, fossil instead of well, something else? Uh, 
Well, how much time did it take you to get uh, knowledge with Git, for example? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good example. Now I can show you something. Suppose. Suppose I have a workspace. And I want to create a project. Here. I have a directory something. I put some files in it. Then I think, okay, I want to start using Fossil. I want to create a database which stores this. I do create a database. Fossil, new, something. Fossil. Something called fossil. That's my database. I can use it to commit uh, things in it. Okay, now I want to commit abc.txt in it. And then I do fossil open something in fossil. <coughs> okay, now I've opened the database and connected with the current directory. Fossil add abc. That doesn't work very well. <laughs> That's the reason because I have a, I use Notepad as an editor, but it has some problem with the screens. So I, I do it like this. Uh, and normally it opens the browser, but well. Sigwin with Windows. Um, it has a new commit. Now, now I have uh, committed it. This all this, this a few, com few commits that I can start working. Now, what do I really have? I can type fossil UI. And then my Firefox opens. Here. Yeah. My this is the GitHub in a box part. Yes. It starts the server, opens the browser, connect with this. And here I can see files I have. I can see a timeline, what happened. Okay, the initial commit is when I created it. And I can do things with it. For example, if I'm not satisfied, if I say, hey, this commit on trunk, I'm not satisfied with this. It contains a bug. So let's edit it. I want to <coughs> start of a new branch. Mistake. It was a mistake. And the command is not so useful in this. Changes. Now let's look at the time of mine. You can see exactly in the history what happened. This commit moved to another branch. And, and you can look at it at the past. Yeah, the timeline is an ideal feature. You can get a structure of exactly what happened in the past. It's really very quick to start using it. If you know the subversion model, just think of that, so, okay, I just commit in one line. 
and start branching is not difficult at all. You can get acknowledged with it in, in half an hour. <coughs> Setting up a, a server like, like I did, this is all you need to know. So I think it's easy, much easier than it. I would uh, like to uh, suggest that you are end for the presentation. Okay. Are there more questions? So, uh, yeah. then uh, Jan Nijmans, thank you for giving the presentation. Please uh, give him an applause. Uh, I'm sorry for being so abrupt with uh, the um, well, well, we will uh, have some uh, hapjes and drankjes. Uh, food. <laughs> yeah, but the point is um, uh, we will go right on with the presentation about uh, Tor, the onion router. Uh, so please uh, get some uh, uh, food and come back. And, uh, I know it's not polite to eat and watch presentations, but uh, we simply don't have uh, time to have a break. So.